Hello, Susie. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I'm so glad and thankful that we got connected through LinkedIn. And from what I know, um, you've been already two years since you started your business as a translator. Yeah, it's just coming up to two years now. Um, I started in March 2020, mainly just doing voluntary oh. translations um, because I was also doing some COVID volunteering in the community at the time. So I wasn't a full-time translator, but that's when I first started doing professional translations. So really almost two years. Almost two years, yeah. And I can see that you've had a, already abundant career experiences, including IT and financial services. That's and I, right. Yes, I, and I know that you received a diploma in translation in 2007, but you were working as a business analyst when you chose to become a professional translator. Could you probably kindly yeah. share how you yeah. chose to become a professional translator? Okay, it's quite a long story, <laughs> but um, I'll start from the beginning. So I studied French at university. I did a degree in French and I think you did too, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah. yeah, so I did my degree in French and when you study a foreign language at a UK university, mm -hmm. normally in the third year of studies, you go and live um, and either teach English or study in a foreign country where the language you're studying is spoken. So in my case, I went to live in France. I worked as an English assistant in a French school. Um, and it was an extraordinary year that I will never forget. And I learned so much in that one year, probably more than I'd learned the previous 10 years that I'd studied French at school. It was, it was an incredible experience both for my level of French and also for cultural understanding. It was the first time I lived in a foreign country and it was a real amazing experience. And I thought, I really want to work with languages. I really want to use my language skills in my work. And um, when I first finished my studies, I went and worked in Brussels for a European institution um, in the area of air traffic control so it was quite quite specialized but really fascinating but it meant that I was using my French um, every day because the institution operated in both French and English so oh. I, was a bilingual, I was sort of a bilingual secretary at that time so that was a really valuable experience but for, for personal reasons I returned to the UK after a year and decided um, to find a job um, and I was just looking at graduate career options. Um, and for various reasons, I ended up becoming a computer programmer. That was my first job. Really? Yes. I didn't know about that, about you. Yeah, I was a trainee programmer. Oh. Um, working for a financial services company, basically writing programs that helped them to run their business. Um, and I gradually sort of rose through the ranks, um, becoming more of a designer. So I would design the system and then somebody else would write the system. And then I moved more into a business analyst role where I was sort of a middleman between the people in the business who were operating, doing the operational work and the technical people who are writing the program. So I was kind of a bridge between almost translating exactly. what the business wanted into a technical solution. So I guess I was probably already translating in a way. In a way, in yes, days. definitely. Mm. But um, I, I did that same job in, in various different industries. So not just in financial services, but also insurance. Um, also in paper manufacturing, um, in higher education. I worked at a university. So I've had really varied experience, but throughout all of that experience, I knew that I wasn't using my French. Mm. And that was a source of frustration for me. But I couldn't, I, I was so involved in my career that I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't see what to do. 
but translation did seem like um, an obvious thing to do. Um, so I thought I'll do the diploma and see if I can do it because I'm the sort of person that I don't necessarily believe in myself until I prove that I can do something, if you know what I mean. So I did the um, Chartered Institute of Linguists Diploma in Translation, which is a very, you know, it's an internationally recognized um, exam. And I, I guess I didn't realize really that it was, it was such a high level exam. And I had no experience, no practical experience of translation. I just loved French. Um, and in my work, I used to write a lot of documents and things in English. So I had to express myself well in English, in writing as well. So I guess those skills together came together and I ended up passing the diploma. But I didn't become a translator because I had certain misconceptions, firstly about the profession. So I believed that you couldn't really make a living from translation. Oh, I think a lot of people think it's, that. It's a common think, misunderstanding, yes. Yeah, exactly. They it think gets it's scary, a hobby. Right? It's, it's a hobby. It's a side, you know? si side gig. It's a side gig. Yeah. A side gig, exactly that. So I thought, well, I won't, I won't be able to do it. Um, and I thought also, well, my French isn't good enough. You know, I didn't live in France for long enough. Mm. There are people who are much better at French than me, who are properly bilingual. I'm not good enough. So I told myself misconceptions both about the profession and about my own abilities. I essentially stopped myself from becoming a translator because of my misconceptions. Um, but I continued, so I continued to be a business analyst. Um, I started working more as a consultant, which meant that I got paid on on a day rate basis. I was paid a lot of money to come into a company and provide business analysis services. So I thought what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start saving money um, and putting it aside. And then perhaps I can try and see if I can make it as a translator. So I did that before becoming a translator, probably about a year before I joined a Facebook group for translators. Mm. And from that, I learned so much about the profession. I was able to understand that my misconceptions were incorrect, that it is possible to be successful. It's possible for it to be your full-time career and for you to, to thrive as a translator. So I, I knew that it was possible. I wasn't sure if I could be a freelancer because mm -hmm. I thought I'll have to go and find clients. Am I capable of doing that? Am I that sort of person? Because I'm quite shy, I'm quite introverted, but going and finding clients means you have to come out and say to people, I can do this. You sell yourself to people. So I still wasn't sure if I could do it, but after about a year and then the pandemic came along, my contract came to an end. I'd saved a lot of money and I thought, this is a career that can be done fully remotely. So I can do it during the pandemic. Some other types of jobs um, would, not, would not be possible. So yeah, I, I just gave it a go. Um, wow. And here I am today. And I think I was frustrated for a long time, unhappy in my previous career. Um, but now I realize, now that I'm a translator, I realize that actually those experience were those experiences were really valuable mm. in my career as a translator because I've worked in lots of different industries. I've got wide knowledge. Um, I can adapt easily to, to change. Exactly. You know, I've had lots of different mm. jobs mm. Um, and I can pick things up really quickly. So I think what I perceived as a weakness because I, I failed to become a translator I actually built up a lot of useful business experience as well. Just a business sense that has been really helpful in setting myself up. As exactly. A exactly. And I was so impressed about um, because the, I could see your courage to choose to 
to be able to use this wide knowledge about different industries. And I can see that you're already working on different online contents, which I'm definitely sure your knowledge from the past experiences are helping enormously. And another yeah. thing I was impressed about is, is your online presence. You mentioned that you're introverted. I'm an introvert, such an introverted person too. And normally um, shy people, tend to, you know, prefer working by themselves quietly. And you mentioned in this video with Adrian that we tend to, you know, help people, support people from the backside yeah. quietly and diligently. Yeah. And we yeah. prefer it that way. But you also somehow, you know, taught yourself and you're very capable of using your online presence. So that would be my second question about your post on LinkedIn. I love your posts so much. They're authentic, yet very informative, very you, um, like with, with, sure, with good vibes. So I was wondering, you know, as translators, we have so much to learn from you. So would you have any tips about, you know, where and how you get post ideas or how to put yourself out there? Yeah, so I think ideas for my posts really come, they come into a couple of different categories. The first thing is um, language and cultural exchange. So I have lots of stories. I have a whole bank of stories from when I lived in France, from when I lived in Belgium, from those times were so memorable that I still hold those memories, even, if, even though it was a long time ago. Um, I still think, oh, I remember that time in the Belgian bar where I asked for something and, and I didn't realize that in Belgium they use this term, you know? Mm. So just little observations that have stayed with me and I tell a story about them. And from that story, I impart some, an interesting quirk about language. So there's stories about language and cultural exchange. Um, then there's little things that I notice in the way that non-native speakers use English, where they might use um, an incorrect preposition or mm -hmm. something, or use an article when they don't need to. Or So I notice little common quirks, and I think, how can I explain this in a way that might make someone, might click in someone's mind, and they mm -hmm. think, oh, okay. I'll know that for next time. So little sort of learning points. I think, I think secretly I've probably got um, a teacher in me somewhere, but I'm too scared to become a teacher. But instead, I, I sort of impart these slightly educational posts. And also just talking about my journey as a freelancer, because, you know, I have surprised myself, really, of mm. what I've been able to achieve as someone who really didn't believe um, that I was good enough, um, but just being astonished by what I've managed to achieve and celebrating that in my own little way. But I think the important thing is to, is to be authentic. Don't try to force yourself to talk about something if you're not interested in it, mm. or um, you know, if, you, if you're not, if you don't feel it, if it doesn't feel like you, and I think, that everything I post, it comes from the heart. I don't spend ages laboring over, over it. I just mm. have an idea and think, right, I'm just gonna tell a story about this. Mm. And once I start writing the post, it, it seems to flow quite naturally. So I just, um, yeah, I just seem to, to have an ability to just tell these little stories. Mm. Um, but yeah, authenticity, I think is important. I think people can see that in posts. Exactly. They can yeah. tell if you're being authentic. They can feel it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I saw your, again, in interview, this fascinating interview about online strategies with Adrian. Mm. And I could see that you, you really do have strategies about both finding freelancing tests, but also how to use your online visibility. You mentioned several times about the power of LinkedIn too. So how important is it for you to use the online presence in working as a translator? Um, I think for me, it's vitally important. I think people who have been translating for a long time, who have their reputation, 
who get um, they, who have enough clients, who have enough work, and who get enough work through word of mouth. I think online presence probably isn't as important to them. But I think if you're starting out, you don't have a reputation. Nobody knows who you are unless you tell them who you are. So that's for me. That's what online presence is about. It's about saying this is me this is what i'm like i don't really go for the the hard sell you know i just talk about things that interest me and mention how translation can help businesses with what they're doing um i didn't really think of it as particularly strategic i was just quite instinctive about it but because i could see that i was getting engagement because I could see that I was able to attract both colleagues in terms of the community and um, clients who were interested in what I was saying and wondered if I could help them. Because that was working, I carried on doing what I was doing. Um, so yeah, I think I started out actually with a Facebook page. I do have a Facebook page and I, I did get you know, a bit of engagement on there. But compared to LinkedIn, it was nothing. You know, LinkedIn is so open. Um, it is. Every, all, of, all of the comments and interactions that you have on LinkedIn, they can all be seen, you know? So it's really powerful. And that's what I mean by the power of LinkedIn is, is the, the domino effect of you comment somewhere, someone notices it, they look at your profile, they think you're interesting, they, they connect with you. And then you start seeing their connections, posts, um, you start reacting to those. It just, it just spirals into this huge network, both of colleagues um, who are really supportive and a community feel um, to actually reaching out to clients. So, yeah, it is, it's incredibly powerful. And, and it, as I say, it happened more instinctively than strategically. Um, in terms of finding my initial clients, I went through the classic route of going through lists of agencies, mm -hmm. identifying agencies that I thought could use my skills and, and talents. And really, to begin with, I had to focus on my past work experience because I didn't have much translation experience. So um, trying to stand out from the crowd by sending them an email that wasn't just, dear sir, please find attach my CV, trying to personalize it, mm. find out what um, the personality of their brand and how I could uh, fit in with that. So Exactly. Yeah. I, I have used, you have uh, such a good point in personalizing the emails, especially yes. when you're reaching out for the first time, you want to make the impression. And yes. even if it's not the next day, they'll reach out to you if they have your name on their mind. Yeah, that's right. And that's what yes. I found as well. It took a long time for anyone to reply to me. But exactly. some agencies have come back to me, you know, maybe eight months, maybe a year later saying, right. oh, we have a job for you. So obviously I did make an impression on them, but they just didn't have anything for me at the time. Exactly. So it's it's, it's so normal that we don't hear from them. Like I, I didn't hear from um, one of them for two years. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, it happens all the time. So I even think, if you I don't hear that, it from, yeah, young, younger people who are just starting out often become discouraged by the fact that they true, don't get true, 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 true. but they just need to carry on um, sure. and, and, and they will get results. They will. So this is already my last question. Um, now I know that you're such a creative person and you're good at storytelling. I can see and you're already handling marketing materials, online contents, but do you also have other special projects on your mind you're planning to take on or you, you, you want to work on um, down the road? And do you also have some comments for your peer translators? Or who, okay, so uh, in terms of work, work projects, um, I've recently started doing um, online courses, translating online courses. Oh. Um, and I found that I absolutely love it. Um, I've done a, a few now, and I think that I would like this to be one of my main specialities because I think it, it draws upon 
my love of explaining things, explaining things clearly exactly. so that people yes. who don't know the subject will understand it. So I think I think that really plays to, to my strengths. Um, and also it allows you to learn new things as well because you're going through the entire course from start to finish. So you learn things. So it's, it's a really great special, uh, specialism and I'd love to develop in that area. Mm. I'd also like to... Uh, look into voiceover. I've done a voiceover course, um, but at the moment I don't have my work set up very um, properly set up. So at the moment I'm working in the kitchen. It's quite echoey, but I am currently refurbishing my home office and I'm going to move into there Exciting. and hopefully set up a bit of a studio for voiceover. So that would that would be nice. Um, and I've also I'd like to make more video content. I think. Um, I would I really love to see many of them. Mm. I've done a couple of videos so far and they, they're always well received. Um, it's just that it takes time, you know, to do it. it. I'm quite a perfectionist, like a lot of translators. <laughs> so good and results. Mm. Yes, exactly. I want it to look good. Um, and with a text, it's fine because you can just change a word here and there. You can You can edit it. But if it's a video, it's a longer process of editing so Much longer. Mm -hmm. it's something that I'd like to do mm -hmm. but apart from that um I just I just love being part of the community the online translation community particularly on LinkedIn but not only on LinkedIn I'm also part of some groups in on Facebook as well um and I just think it, it's so nice to have colleagues all over the world like you know I'm talking to you you're in South Korea Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> what you're doing is brilliant. The way that you're just reaching out and chatting to translators and finding out that we all have a different combination of experiences, but we have this one thing in common, translation, exactly. which is yes. profession. And, and, and love for language too. Love for language, love for Literature. acceptance of other cultures. Yes. Um, just an open-mindedness that is just so heartwarming. Um, and I'd like to thank you for, for your little project of reaching out to other translators. I, I thank you. you so much for your time, Susie. I, I wish you all the best and I'll see you again on LinkedIn very often, hopefully. Yes, I'll see you very soon. Thank you, Jane, for you inviting too. me. It's been thank really you. nice chatting to you. You too, bye-bye. Bye-bye.